Ms. Lawson, it's your opportunity to uh, address the court. Um, since I was arrested last year, I've learned a lot. I was forced to stop and evaluate my life and where I'm headed. I've learned a lot about myself through several months of intensive therapy. Um, I've learned what caused me to commit my crimes, and I've been actively working on overcoming my weaknesses and bettering myself um, because I know I need it. Throughout this experience, I've learned that good people are capable of making really bad decisions when life is hard. Um, I've struggled with an identity crisis. I always thought I was a good person. I had a good, I have, I still have a good heart. And I made some really poor choices that I will regret for the rest of my life. Um, Something that impacted all of this um, for 15 years, I was in a toxic relationship that was emotionally and mentally abusive. I left that relationship to find peace for my children and for myself. My marriage was extremely damaging to my self-esteem and my mental health. I alone am responsible for my actions, but I believe that this relationship was the catalyst that set me on the path to where I am today. I can't tell you how many dreams I've had where I have apologized to the family of the victim. <laughs> Wishing I could do it in person months and months and months ago. So I want to apologize to the victim and his family for any pain that I have caused. I want to apologize to the community and anyone I've let down. I want to apologize to my family and my kids for the heartache and trauma I have caused throughout all of this. My family has shown me unconditional love and reminded me of who I truly am as a person. That's all, Your Honor. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, Ms. Lawson, I do have a couple of questions for you uh, before I pronounce the sentence here today. I, I'll have a couple of comments to make after doing so. Um, when I read the reports, the PSIs that I get, and they're often lengthy, and, and all of the attached reports associated with them, which are often lengthy, uh, but I review them uh, in detail. I read every letter. I read every report. I want to know as much as I can about this case before an ultimate decision is made. In this instance, the decision being, um, do I accept the binding plea agreement or not? That's really the major decision that uh, had to take place. I wrote down this sentence from the PSI, which was a report of something you said in your interview. It said, it reports that you said, I think a writer would be better than prison. Is that a true statement? Is that something you said during the pre-sentence yes. interview? Yes? Yes, Your Honor. Yes. So I want to, I want to make a point about that. And I want to ask you a question or two. Uh, the reality here, and, and let me ask you this first. Do you agree as you sit here today, that you entered into this plea agreement willingly and voluntarily? Yes, Your Honor. At any point in time, do you anticipate, at any point, now or in the future, ever saying, because I see this quite often, my attorney made me do this, and I didn't want to. I didn't think the plea agreement was fair, and you're going to go to prison, and that's not a pleasant place. And while you're there, you may say have uh, remorse about that fact and say to yourself, you know, this is my attorney's fault. He made me enter this plea agreement, and I shouldn't have done it. Do you anticipate in your own mind that ever being the case? No, Your Honor. Uh, do you agree that you talked through all the ramifications and details of this plea agreement 
with your attorney, and he has ex demonstrated to you his ability to understand and explain these circumstances to a degree that you felt comfortable accepting the plea agreement? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Do you feel like the state has um, overreached in terms of, uh, because they have a lot to say about what the plea agreement's going to be, do you think they've overreached or abused you in any way in terms of the plea agreement that they've insisted that you enter into? No, Your Honor. Okay. The reason I ask all these questions is because I don't want there to be later, uh, you could call it buyer's remorse, I don't know, but I don't want that to be the case later on. I, I'm, I'm in Blackfoot Monday covering, I think there's 42 files or something I'm covering on Monday. And one of those is a case where the defendant, I think it's a murder case as I recall, got a sentence and now is filing what we call a post-conviction relief petition, where the defendant is now saying, my attorney screwed up. They did a bad job. They didn't investigate the case properly. If they had done that, I wouldn't have been convicted of this crime, and I wouldn't be sitting here in prison. And I'll tell you what, I've been doing this for 16 years. There isn't a judge in the state who hates post-conviction relief petitions more than me. Because it's just the blame game. I'm going to blame my lawyer now because of what my circumstances are. Uh, any of those things that I'm going to have to face on Monday in Blackfoot are part of your thought process today in terms of your representation by this attorney. You feel like any of those things are true. He didn't investigate it properly. He didn't prepare properly. He hasn't done the job he should have done. Any of those things are a concern to you as you sit here today? No, Your Honor. Very well. Uh, because I don't want to uh, come up here covering for Judge Boyce in a year and have a have to deal with a post-conviction relief petition from you. You understand what I'm saying? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Now, before I pronounce the sentence, the sentence part is easy, to be honest with you. As I've said, I'm not opposed to accepting uh, the plea agreement, but I do want to make a couple of comments. Uh, I don't know if any of you remember this. I don't know why it is. I always get called on to do this kind of stuff. But there was a sheriff in Bingham County who got accused of pulling a firearm on a... Um, I think it was a Sunday school teacher and six teenagers that were in her car, yanking the teacher out of the car, put, pulling the gun in, his fa in her face, threatened, threatening to shoot her. He was the sheriff of Bingham County. Of course, nobody in, the, in their right mind would have touched that case with a 10-foot pole, so guess who got to do it? Me. So I went to Blackfoot for months and dealt with that case. And in that, when I was doing the sentencing, and it took an hour because there were, the room was a lot more full than even this is today. I had a group of people who thought the defendant was being harshly punished. He didn't, you know, he's a good guy. He didn't do anything really that bad. And I had a whole group of people on the other side of the room who wanted me to take him out in the parking lot and string him up. That's usually the feeling you get on these Cases that divide a community, and this has to a degree. So I'm going to make a comment to those of you who are your supporters. And I've heard some things today which are not, frankly, unusual, that always bother me when I hear them. And if there have been people in your family or supporters of yours that have said, I'm still talking, so stop that. <laughs> who have said bad things, terrible things to the victim's family, they should be ashamed of themselves. There's no excuse for that. None. We clear about that? I know I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to people in the back, probably. But I'm, I'm trying to make that point. It's an important point to make. Uh, the next thing I want to say is this said something which I thought was interesting. He said, there's a double standard in these cases. You might be surprised to hear this. Uh, people often are. This is about the, the sixth time 
at least the fifth time, probably the sixth time, I've dealt with a case like this where the defendant was a female teacher. Sometimes the victims are male and sometimes they're female. I've had both. But I, this is not uncommon to me. I've dealt with this many times. And there is a feeling out there that female teachers are treated more leniently than male teachers. If a male teacher does this, I had a, there was a coach in Soda Springs, I had that case for a while too, uh, who abused one of the students. Man, that, that everybody wanted him hung up. Uh, there, there is a tendency to feel that way. And there isn't a double standard. The standard's the same. A person under age does not have the legal ability to consent to this kind of behavior. Does not have it. The responsibility is all on the defendant. None of this is the victim's fault. Not one bit of it. And, uh, Having said that, I want to make the point that I understand you've been through some difficult times. There hasn't been one of these cases where I haven't had a female in front of me, a defendant, who hasn't, who hasn't told me a similar story, frankly, about it, usually an abusive marriage and low self-esteem. And uh, uh, the psychosexual talks about attention-seeking, needing attention, and some things like that. And the alcohol is a hugely complicating factor here. Alcohol and drugs to some extent. Um, none of those things. Even if you were experiencing them, I'm sorry that you were, is an excuse. Not one of them is an excuse. And you didn't make excuses today. And I, and I appreciate that. Not once did you say the word mistake, which I'm thrilled to death that you didn't say because I won't accept that word. You made bad choices, and you acknowledge that, and I appreciate that. So the reality is is that this is a hugely difficult circumstance, which is very polarizing for uh, especially a small community like this. I've been driving through and about this community my whole life uh, in a variety of different ways. And my parents are from Bear Lake County, and that's the same kind of a county. And these are difficult situations in these kinds of uh, counties and, and these kinds of communities. And so I feel great sorrow. And I'm, I'll make one final comment before I impose the sentence, and that is I hope today is kind of the end of it, it it's something to that effect. I wish that were true. <laughs> I wish that were true. It's not true. They'll, they're still suffering in Blackfoot. And I sentenced that guy two years ago. Uh, they're still suffering in this community and will for a while. He's right when he says his son will take years to go through the process of dealing with this and understanding that he's way too young to understand it fully now. And it'll impact you and your family for a lengthy period of time. Healing is often a long and difficult process for everybody. And it will be for you and it will be for them. And I'm hugely sorry about that, but I didn't earn every one of these gray hairs on my head or white hairs on my head for nothing. I've only been in the law for 47 years. I've seen everything that can and can happen in the law, and I've seen all the tragedy and the aftermath of the tragedy and how difficult that is for people to process. And the most thrilling thing I heard today was him saying, I, I, he forgives you. Forgiveness is an interesting thing. I've studied that topic quite a bit, actually. And, uh, and forgiveness is not for you. It's for them. That's the people who forgive, they receive the benefit of it. The person who they're forgiving hardly gets any benefit out of it at all. But you may, may need to do some forgiving as well, and I hope you will as time goes on. It's not going to be easy, but you can do this. 
and you will get some treatment, and you need some treatment. The, the psychosexual is interesting because I've read these things a lot, many times over the years. There's no standards for women. There are lots of standards for men because we have lots of men sex offenders. There's no standards for women. It's hard to figure out, even for there's one of the best in the business when it comes to this thing, these things. It's hard to know. Uh, but, and then she made a specific comment, which I don't see very often. You need some treatment with somebody who has experience dealing with women sex offenders. There aren't very many people like that. So I hope that you get that kind of treatment in your life because that will be the rehabilitation part of what you need. You understand what I'm saying? Yes, Your Honor. Do you have any questions from me before I pose a sentence? No, I don't think so, Your Honor. Okay. I'm imposing a sentence of two fixed and 18 indeterminate imposed. The defendant will go into custody today. The costs are $540.50. The fine is $500. There will be a DNA sample that will have to be supplied to the Department of Corrections. There's a $100 cost for that. You will be required to register as a sex offender if you ever get out into the community on parole. And you will be required as a condition of treatment in prison and uh, on parole when that time comes to submit to and comply with and successfully complete any necessary sex offender treatment as required by the prison system or ultimately your parole officer. Do you understand that? Yes, Your Honor. Is there any restitution sought here? There's no restitution, Your Honor. No, okay. Sometimes there's counseling and things like that. You don't have anything to submit very well. All right, so no restitution. Let me take that out. And uh, so that's the sentence. Do you have any questions about the sentence? No, Your Honor. From the state? No. And uh, you have 42 days to appeal this sentence. Oh, no, you don't have 42 days to appeal the sentence because in the plea agreement you waived an appeal. That's right. So you don't, there's no appeal here. You understand that? Yes, Your Honor. 42 days are gone. All right? And today. Any questions from anybody? None, Your Honor. The no contact order. Oh, thank you. Yes. I, I sometimes forget that. Thank you. Uh, yes, there is a no contact order in place that prevents contact with the victim. And I don't remember if it, 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 it goes to the victim's family as well, does it? Just list the victim. Just, just the victim. That no contact order, it's not often you get to do this, but you, no, normally no contact order lasts a year and then you have to renew it. In this case, the no contact order is for 20 years. No contact of any kind, electronic, personal, by phone, in any way, shape, or form, through social media. No contact means no contact. And I'm very strict about that, okay? With the victim of any kind for the entire 20 years. Uh, Anything else? Thank you for that reminder. Anything else? All right. It's on each count run concurrent. Thank you. Yes. There's two counts. I've forgotten that. So there are two counts, the same count, but the sentence is imposed on each count, but they are run concurrent to each other. So not one after the other. They run on top of each other. Do you understand? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Deputy, you can take the defendant into custody. And uh, we are in recess.